Thanks for arriving to my talk. I will tell you about the power of large-scale generative models and large-scale reinforcement learning. So I'll start by reminding you what OpenAI is about. Our mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence by which we mean highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at all economically valuable work, benefit all of humanity. And so, to accomplish it, we need to do a lot of work. Much of it is technical. And in this talk, I'll tell you a lot of the, work we, a lot of the technical work we've done over the past year. And I'll begin with telling you about our work on large-scale reinforcement learning. And more specifically, if you look under the hood, Reinforcement learning based automated curricula. So I'll start by telling you about OpenAI 5, which is one of our proudest achievements. So the goal of OpenAI 5 was to train a neural network that would play the game of Dota 2 as well as possible. The thing you need to know about Dota is that it used to be a grand challenge in AI, not anymore. The reason it used to be a grand challenge in AI, because it is more similar to the real world than all previous games that were sold by AI. That's number one. And number two, this game is very hard because there are many humans that dedicate their lives to the game to be as good as possible. It is a vibrant professional scene, and there is more than $35 million given out in annual prizes. And prior to our work, no system did well on real-time strategy games. So the achievement, our achievement of 2019, is that we trained a large neural, well, you know, mid-sized neural network. We trained a mid-sized neural network that defeated the best, the strongest humans in the world, the, st the world champions, in a live match of a best of three, Team OG. And I'll show you a quick video the agent will fall, and that is GG game over. OpenAI taking game two, taking the series two to zero. But honestly, this second game in particular, this is a fantastic example of something that, as a. So, this is, this was the moment where we defeated the world champions in a live match. And so, how did we do it? Large scale RL. It's so simple, especially in retrospect. We simply used a lot of CPUs and a lot of GPUs, and we trained our neural network, whose size is that of the brain of a small insect, to play the game for 45,000 years. <laughs> and that turned out to be enough. And you know, there are lots of details, but the main... So in response to that, you may wonder, where is the science? You just didn't invent anything. You just took RL and made it larger. But that's actually not a correct point of view. The science is in the discovery that reinforcement learning is a lot more powerful than people thought. This is actually a theme in deep learning, where if you look at the history of deep learning, for the longest time, people thought, oh, these neural networks, they can't do anything. But then you give them lots of compute, and suddenly they start to do things. And that happened with supervised learning. And just you keep using more GPUs and faster GPUs, and you just solve more problems. And then the same happened with RL. In 2015 and 2016, reinforcement learning was at such a state that it just no one thought it could do anything. And it seemed completely inconceivable at the time that reinforcement learning could solve a game as hard as Dota, that it could beat the world champions. So that's the real advance, the discovery that reinforcement learning at scale is more powerful than people thought, almost all people thought. Another really cool thing I want to mention about the Dota result is that learning was surprisingly human interpretable. As the bot was training, you could simply look at it play, and you could understand what it does. Its performance was very human interpretable. You could literally say, oh, I can see that it's pursuing this strategy, but it hasn't discovered how to use that particular item or something like this. And then you would think, why, 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 is it, why does it have trouble discovering how to use this item? And the answer would usually come up. And it will have the form of, well, um, something like, in order to use this item, you need to understand how it's intended to be used. If you just randomly try to apply it, you'll never succeed. So you need to have certain circum you need to be exposed to circumstances where this item could be used. So you modify the item a little bit to make it more usable more frequently. And then reinforcement learning figures out how to use it. So there is this human 
babysitting involved. But the babysitting was surprisingly relatively easy because learning was human interpretable. And I think that's really cool, and I think we'll expect more of that. As the systems get smarter, it will be, in some sense, easier to relate to them because they'll be more interpretable. And this is a photo of the OpenAI Dota team together with Team OG, who are the world champions. And in December, we announced the Dota paper, which de details all the results, all the details, all the experiments that we did. And in particular, it has one nice tidbit I'll tell you about. We ran a replication study where we reran our pipeline in a simplified manner. And we produced a new bot, which defeated the bot that defeated the world champions 98% of the time. <laughs> so one of the nice things about our daughter result is that we didn't use any human data. We just asked our neural net to play against the copy of itself. And as a result, when the neural net got, became stronger and better, so did its opponent. And as a result, the level of, level of play kept improving automatically on its own without any ingestion of data from the outside. So you have this automated curriculum emerging from the self-play. And one thing which we wanted to explore is what would be other places where this kind of automated curriculum could show up. And we were inspired by ideas around artificial life and emergent complexity. And we thought it would be cool to design a system where we could get some compelling emergent complexity, compelling layering of strategies. And I'll show you our result, which is titled under Emergent Tool Use for Multi-Agent Interaction. Now I'll just show you a sequence of videos where you have this game of hide and seek. You've got these red seekers and blue hiders. And the way the game works is that the, the, the seekers need to catch the hiders. And when they first started training, they really didn't know how to play the game. They didn't really know what to do. They didn't even know how to move. But then, eventually, the seekers realized they need to, to, to fall to chase the hiders. And that's what they did. And after that, the hiders realized that, wait a second, well, those seekers are chasing us. We need to barricade ourselves. <laughs> and now the seekers can no longer chase us. Well, but then the seekers made some more progress and thought, well, we have this ramp thing. Why don't we use that? Now we can catch the seekers again. So then the hiders became smart and said, well, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the, the seekers should, shouldn't have the ramp. And we, we generalized that to other circumstances, and it worked kind of the way you'd expect, where here the seeker said, well, you know, you got to kind of push all the ramps away and hide so that the, the, hiders won't be able, the seekers won't be able to catch them. So you get this stuff. But then. The system produced one result that really surprised us, and I'll show it to you right now. It was a really surprising result. You kind of couldn't understand what's going on, what's go, what was going on for a while. So you have another situation kind of like the one I showed you before, where the hider barricaded itself, and it, you put, if you can see those little lock icons on top of the ramps, which means that the seeker can't use them. But the seeker did the following. It was pushing this block, and it jumped on top of it using one of the, one of the ramps and he was able to catch the seeker. So then we call this block surfing. So that's really cool because it's also an indication that those systems can be creative in a meaningful way. Of course, if you think about the Dota result and earlier Alpha Zero, it should be obvious that those systems are creative. But it's nice to see it really visually and viscerally. It's pretty good. It's a little different from supervised learning where normally the system will do whatever the data tells it to do. Here, the system produces new stuff, creative, interesting, and it solves a problem. So that was a very fun, very satisfying result. But now that I want to segue to our next result that we are very proud of from 2019, Dactyl. One, one thing which you can say about deep reinforcement learning of the, of the variety that actually produces really cool high-performance systems is that it requires extremely large amounts of compute and extremely large amounts of experience, which is the far worse problems. The fact that it needs all this experience presumably suggests that you shouldn't be able to apply it on any um, real-world problem because, let's say, usually real-world experience is hard to come by. So. What to do about that? This problem 
was one of our part of our motivation to pursue the dactyl project, which is a robot hand that was trained with reinforcement learning to perform the movements that solve the Rubik's Cube, the physical manipulation of it. And we were able to do it with deep reinforcement learning. And I'll tell you how. Like everything in machine learning, it's very simple from a high-level point of view. We use the very simple idea called domain randomization. Basically, the idea is that we will use deep reinforcement learning, which at this point we established is very powerful, to train a neural network to do very fast seem to real using a very small amount of data. So how did we do that? Well, take your simulation. Why can, why, so to answer that question, we want to take a step back and try to understand why can't we even train the whole thing in simulation without any problems? And the answer is obvious, because there is a difference between the physical thing and the simulation. And there are lots of differences. Real physics is very hard to simulate. It's in, we don't have simulators which can do that. I, I found out at some point that simulating friction is apparently NP-complete. <laughs> and there are lots of, that doesn't seem right, but Let's ignore that. More, more importantly, you just don't know the state of the physical system. You don't know the masses of the fingers. You don't know the approximate frictions, which you simulate badly. There are lots of things which are unknown. So how to deal with them? And the answer is, we want to train a robust policy that can deal with any of these variations. We want to have a policy which can deal with any mass of the, of the cube, with any size of the cube, with any friction, with any, like, think of many different ways in which you might, might, might vary the system. You want the neural net policy to be able to deal with all of them. And then the thinking goes, if it can deal with all of them, then it should also be able to deal with the real world and adapt to it very quickly. One other technical tool that I'll mention is the idea of automa automatic domain randomization, where we used an automated curriculum idea that gradually increased the complexity of the automatic, of the domain randomization. And what it led to, well, the consequence of that was that it learned faster and it reached better performance. And I'll show you just some videos. So here is a video of the robot just doing its thing, slowly solving the cube. And it's really fun to watch in person. And you, you can just imagine how if we, waited, if we kept looking at the video for, for another minute or so, it would solve the whole thing. But I also want to mention that the tra total training experience was 13,000 years. And that was necessary because we wanted to train our neural net to do this domain adaptation. We wanted it to be able to very quickly adapt to the physical robot, which is different from the simulations. One other thing I'll mention is the performance of the system. In order to solve the Rubik's Cube, in order to solve a scrambled Rubik's Cube, you need to perform many of the, you need to perform a large number of these kind of movements in sequence. And the kind of movements you need to perform are of two kinds. You need to reorient the block. So when the block is, so right now you can see it reorient, reorienting the block. And you need to rotate the faces. And you need to do that some tens of numbers of times. And if you look at that whole process, solving the cube by, doing, by executing these movements some tens of numbers of times, we were able to achieve a 60% success rate. And we were also able to achieve a 20% success rate when you were to give it the hardest scrambled cubes possible. So with a little bit better sensors and larger neural networks, it seems likely that performance should improve. But that's the status there. So to sum it up, the thing you should take away from everything I said so far is that large-scale reinforcement learning can do very interesting things in simulation. It can generate very interesting automated curricula. It can generate very, it can be creative and invent new things. And using ideas like domain randomization, you can also take whatever we've learned in simulation and transfer it to the real world. And by the way, I want to mention that the Dota bot also had a bit of a sim to real element in it because it was trained against the bot 
but it played against a human. So this, there is some direct analogy to the robot results. And I want to mention just to show you another, another cool video that shows that the model, that the policy learned to be quite robust to all kinds of unexpected things in the, in the real world. So here you see the robot is wearing a glove. And despite wearing a glove, it can still perform the movement, even though it really wasn't trained to do this. So it really suggests that these neural nets, that our neural nets are really quite powerful. And if you just give them the right data, they can do amazing things. There's also another little result showing that showing significant degrees of robustness to real world, um, to, to real world perturbations. And this is a photo of the amazing robotics team that did this work. Finally, I want to finish this presentation by talking a little bit about GPT-2. And I'll tell you about, I'll start by telling you about the core idea, which is very simple. If you train a neural net to predict the next word extremely accurately, you should learn something about language. Intuitively, it makes sense. If you know what word comes next, you should understand spelling, you should understand syntax, you should probably understand semantics, you should probably understand some very deep ideas about the text. Now, this is a theory. It may or may not be true, but we can find out by taking a big neural net and training it to predict the next word. And so you get two things out of it. One thing you get is that you, have a, you, you, you end up getting a neural network which can generate text because you just predict the next word and feed it back to the neural net. So you get that. And that's already quite nice. But the thing which is really cool, which I find most exciting about the GPT-2 work, is that you get very cool zero-shot performance capabilities. And I'll explain it all. And just I just realized I jumped a little bit ahead of myself. The specific thing we did was to take a one and a half billion parameter transformer and train it on text from the internet. So now that you understand what the system is, which, by the way, again, super simple. It's a simple neural net trained on Mohanan GPUs for a week on some tens of gigabytes of text to predict the next token. The total, nine, the total numbers of lines of code is not very large. So what's, why is this interesting? And so like I mentioned, you can use it to solve all kinds of NLP tasks. But the thing I want to emphasize here is its zero-shot performance capabilities. You can write down a question as text, and it will answer it. And it will do it correctly sometimes, which is really cool. And So it's kind of, it's starting to become, it's, it's starting to turn into a small knowledge base. And I'll tell you about my single favorite capability of this model, and that is the ability to do zero-shot translation from, a, from French to English. You give it lots of, you have a context of a certain length, like 2,000 or 1,000, and you literally say, here's a French sentence, then you say the equal signs, the English sentence, semicolon. Then you say, okay, here's another French sentence, equal sign, English sentence. And you have maybe seven of those because that's what fits in the context. And then you have the eighth sentence where you say, okay, so now what will be the, what will be the continuation? What will be the equal sign? What will come after the equal signs? Just like in the slide. And this thing works. It does something. It's not as good as the best systems, but it does something, zero shot. It means that it somehow learned about the connection between English and French just from reading random websites on the internet. And the thing that's especially notable is this is an accident. We didn't deliberately seek out to build a system that will be good at translation. On the contrary, we filtered all text from the data set that wasn't predominantly in English. So somehow, despite that, it was able to pick up on the co-occurrences between English and French and actually extract them in a way that where translation became possible. And I think it's really cool. I find it's really exciting that it's possible. So there is, this feels like a kind of a maybe different form of machine learning from the one that we are used to. And one thing that was really fun about the GPT-2 work is that it had <clears throat> a lot of popular impact outside of CoreML as well. 
So there is a website where you can go and talk to transformers of various sizes, and people have done that and had conversations with it. One of the coolest things that someone has done was to build the AI dungeon game, which basically is a text adventure game. You just, the way it works is it prints out a little statement, and then you say, do this, and it says, and then it will respond, you did this, now this is happening. And people like it. Apparently, the creator of this game recently tweeted on, the, stated that they had 100 million inferences done in their neural network. So, I mean, is that a lot? Yeah, I think so. Here's a really cool, cool, cool tweet here, um, where someone asked, used the model to make a text adventure game out of installing dependencies. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the text, it's a little bit small, but it's something like, you know, you're trying to install this and this, and it says, install this and continue, install that. Follow the readme instructions. It says, you did this, and this is happening. You need to have additional dependencies you need to worry about. So it's like, it's pretty cool. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that, that's, the, that's the 100 million um, comment I mentioned to you. Oh yeah, someone else built Smart Compose for Code, a plugin called Tab9. And of course, because it's just a language model, you don't need your code to be parsable. Even if you have typos, it's going to work. Even if you have, it, it will be responsive to comments. It will say, well, you know, you see your comments say that it's about such and such. Maybe there is some correlation between the comment and whatever comes uh, in, the, in the text. Now, of course, I think it's quite challenging to use, to have a system which produces code if you then have to look for bugs in the code that it produces. But in this case, the application, you just produce pr pretty short snippets and you can immediately see if they are what you need or not. And it just seems super cool. Someone else has produced a writing assistant. So you have your very smart compose. And someone has fine-tuned the model to produce poetry. And I will read to you a small poem. My heart, why come you here alone? The wild scene of my heart is grown to be a scene, fairy and wild and fair and whole. So that seems, that passes my personal poetry Turing test. <laughs> oh yeah, and someone else had uh, took a GPT-2 and fine tuned it on a medical corpus to do medical Q&A. And of course, all these applications, to be clear, they're still preliminary, this is just the early stages. But it's really exciting to see people trying out these creative applications and actually having people use them. Oh yeah, there is another thing. There is a subreddit simulator. So it's, 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 totally, it's totally crazy. I went into, a, into, I went into it and there was some kind of, um, it was simulating a particular political subreddit and it was having these heated political debates against itself. <laughs> and it, would take you some, it took me some time to understand that, yes, it doesn't fully make sense. <laughs> One other thing I want to talk about a little bit is a retrospective about our staged release, where, as you remember, we didn't release the full model all at once out of concerns that it may have misuse potential. And the specific misuse potential we thought is that you could generate Cheap automated fake news at scale. So what is the real, so I'll talk a little bit about the big picture thinking and then how it unfolded. So the big picture thinking, which I think is absolutely fully true, is that ML is getting more powerful and the field is moving from childhood to maturity. In the past, ML used to be an academic, an academic field where you'd have a small conference and people would just come in and have fun and write papers and discuss ideas, and no one really cared. But the field is successful. You know, in some sense, our dreams of the scientists are coming true. The technology is impactful. But it is, in fact, impactful. And its impact is growing and will continue to grow. And from the perspective of our GPT-2 release, the philosophy that we, that, that we took 
is that you want to start thinking about those things too soon rather than too late. You can always release later, you cannot unrelease. And then also, with the stage release, we saw a lot of beneficial uses and no evidence of malicious ones. So that's on GPT-2. And I want to close my presentation by showing you a sample from Usenet, which is basically a GPT-2 that was trained on MIDI files. One reason why I really like Musenet is because music, especially classical music, obeys a large number of symbolic type rules. And the model learned them. So when you listen to the music that it generates, you can see that the music that it generates also obeys the kind of symbolic rules that classical music should obey, which, is, which gives us some hope, some indication that these models can also learn symbolic notions, totally fine, but just training and taking lots of great innocent steps. And here's the sample. This is all I have to say. Oh. I had some thoughts. Yes. Well, I've heard that we are running a little bit over and people are and people want to get lunch, so I'll be really brief now. Basically, deep learning is exceeding expectations and it's really exciting. That is all. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Ilya. We have time for uh, uh, one or two questions, and then we'll break for lunch. Um, hi. So, here. Here. OK. So you showed some really cool results for games like Dota 2 and mentioned like how it can be generalized to real-world situations, because real-world is hard and complex. But uh, so in real-world, there's like this disparity of state space and action space. Like in Dota 2, the state space is fully observable and like your action space is unlimited, so it's really hard. But like in real world, like say self-driving, your state space is never fully observable, whereas like your action space is really limited. So how do you think like we can bridge this disparity? Okay, so very briefly, one, one thing which is not quite right is that the state in Dota 2 is not fully observable. But more broadly, what you're describing, the fact that you know the size of the state space, the size of the action space, that's not the challenge. The things which are challenge is to make accurate perception, to not make mistakes, to reason, to be robust. Those are the kind of challenges we're facing right now. Our systems are really great. They're super good. They just make mistakes sometimes, so you can't always trust them. You can't deploy them in really important applications where mistakes are costly. So I'd say that it's less about the size of the state space and its full observability, but more about can you be robust? Can you, can, do you have, can you have common sense? Can you reason on your feet? And those are the challenges we need to tackle in upcoming years. OK, thank you. Let's thank Ilya one more time and, and head to lunch. <laughs>